Hello YouTube, welcome back to my channel. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This video took me quite some time to get going, so if you do like the video, please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. Today, I'm gonna give you guys over two hours of private pilot content. Right now, we're gonna cover weather. Please check out my previous video for the first two parts of the ACS. Again, I wanna thank you guys so much for tuning in. If this, does, if this does help you, please make sure to like the video and leave a comment if you have any questions. If I got anything wrong, anything that I can correct, I will clarify in the comments. Again, I wanna thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. Please make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and let's get going. Weather information. What are the general characteristics in regard to the flow of air around high and low pressure systems in the Northern Hemisphere? Advisory Circular 00-6 states low pressure travels inward, upward, and counterclockwise, while high pressure travels outward, downward, and clockwise. Before I go on, I want you guys to know that Advisory Circular 006 is the aviation weather holy grail. Please make sure that you read that about weather. There's everything you could want to know about weather in there, and it is a very, very helpful tool. So let's talk about the atmosphere. So what are the different types of fronts? So a cold front occurs when a mass of cold, dense, and stable air advances and replaces a body of warmer air. An occluded front is a frontal occlusion when a fast-moving cold front catches up with a slow-moving warm front. The two types of these fronts are a cold front occlusion and a warm front occlusion. A warm front is the boundary area formed when a warm air mass contacts and flows over a colder air mass. Lastly, a stationary front is when two forces of air masses are relatively equal and the boundary or front that separates them remains stationary and influences the local weather for days. The weather is typically a mixture of both warm and cold fronts. What are the general characteristics of the weather a pilot can encounter when operating near a cold front and a warm front. For a cold front, expected weather can include a towering cumulonimbus or just cumulonimbus clouds, heavy rain accompanied by lightning, thunder, and or hail. Tornadoes are possible and during passage, poor visibility, winds variable in gusting, temperature dew point, and barometric pressure drop rapidly. With a warm front, as the front passes, expected weather can include stratiform clouds, drizzle, low ceilings, poor visibility, variable winds, and a rise in temperature. What is a tro? A tro is an elongated area of relatively low atmospheric pressure. At the surface, when air converges into a low it cannot go outward against the pressure gradient, nor can it go downward into the ground. It must go upward. Therefore, a low, or tro, is an area of rising air. Think of a tro as where pigs eat. What do pigs out eat out of? Pigs eat out of a tro. A tro is on the ground. Think low. What is a ridge? A ridge is an elongated area of relatively high atmospheric pressure. Air moving out of a higher ridge depletes the quantity of air, therefore these areas are descending air. Descending air favors dissipation of cloudiness, hence the association of high pressure and good weather. What are isobars? An isobar is a line on a weather chart which connects areas of equal or constant barometric pressure. Please make sure that you can understand how to identify isobaric lines on a graphical weather chart. If the isobars are relatively close together on a surface weather chart or a constant pressure chart, what information will this provide? The spacing of isobars on these charts defines how steep or shallow a pressure gradient is. When isobars are spaced very close together, a steep pressure gradient exists, which indicates higher wind speeds. A shallow pressure gradient usually means wind speeds will be less. What is the name of the force that deflects winds to the right in the northern hemisphere and left in the southern hemisphere? This is going to be the Coriolis force. It is a right angle to the wind direction and is directly proportional to wind speed. 
Why do wind speeds generally flow across the isobars at an angle? This is due to surface friction. What does dew point mean? Dew point is the temperature to which a sample of air must be cooled to attain the state of saturation. What factor primarily describes the type and vertical extent of clouds? The stability of the atmosphere will dictate the type and vertical extent of clouds. Explain the difference between a stable atmosphere and an unstable atmosphere. And why is it important? The stability of an atmosphere depends on its ability to resist vertical motion. A stable atmosphere makes vertical movement difficult and small vertical disturbances dampen out and disappear. In an unstable atmosphere, small vertical air mov movements tend to become larger, resulting in turbulent airflow and convective activity. Instability can lead to significant turbulence, extensive vertical clouds, and severe weather. What are the effects of stable and unstable air? Or what are the characteristics of stable versus unstable air? Stable air is going to have stratiform clouds, smooth turbulence, steady precipitation, and poor visibility. Unstable air, you will have cumuliform clouds, rough turbulence, showery precipitation, and good visibility. During your pre-flight planning, what type of information would, should you be aware with respect to icing? Advisory Circular 00-6 states that the, you should be aware with the location of fronts, such as the location, type, speed, and direction of movement, aware of the cloud layers, bases and tops. You should be aware of the freezing levels. It is important to determine how to avoid icing and how to exit icing if accidentally encountered, as well as air temperature and pressure. What is the definition of the term freezing level and how can you determine where that level is? Freezing level is the lowest altitude in the atmosphere over a given location at which the air temperature reaches zero degrees Celsius. It is possible to have multiple freezing layers when a temperature inversion occurs. What conditions are necessary for structural icing to occur? Visible moisture and below freezing temperatures at the point moisture strikes the aircraft. What are the three types of structural icing that may occur in flight? Clear ice. Clear ice forms after initial impact when the remaining liquid portion of the drop flows out over the aircraft surface, gradually freezing as a smooth sheet of solid ice. Rime ice forms when drops are small, such as those in stratified clouds or light drizzle. The liquid portion remaining after initial impact freezes rapidly before the drop has time to spread out over aircraft surface. Mixed ice is a combination of clear and rime ice, and it forms when drops vary in size or when liquid drops are intermingled with snow or ice particles. The ice particles become embedded in clear ice, building a very rough accumulation. Is frost considered to be hazardous to flight? If so, why? Yes, frost is considered to be hazardous to flight because it changes the basic aerodynamic shape of the wing and spoils the smooth airflow of air, thus causing a slowing of airflow. The slowing of the air causes early airflow separation, resulting in a loss of lift. Even a small amount of frost on the airfoils can prevent an aircraft from becoming airborne at a normal takeoff speed. What factors must be present for a thunderstorm to form? You need sufficient water vapor, an unstable lapse rate, and an upward lifting force. What are the three stages of a thunderstorm? The three stages of a thunderstorm are the cumulus stage, the, the mature stage, and the dissipating stage. The cumulus stage are continuous updrafts that cause raindrops to increase in size. The mature stage is rain at the Earth's surface. It falls through or immediately beside the updrafts. It could also include lightning or roll clouds. And dissipating stage are downdrafts and when the rain begins to dissipate. How does fog form? Fog forms when the temperature and dew point of the air become identical or nearly so. 
What are the different types of fog? The different types of fog are radiation fog, advection fog, upslope fog, frontal fog or precipitation induced fog, and steam fog. What causes radiation fog to form? The, the ground cools the adjacent air to the dew point on a calm, clear night. What is advection fog and where is it most likely to form? Advection fog results from the transport of warm, humid air over a cold surface. A pilot can expect advection fog to form primarily along coastal areas during the winter. Unlike radiation fog, it may occur with winds, cloudy skies, at any time of the day or night. What is upslope fog? Upslope fog forms as a result of moist, stable air being cooled adiabatically as it moves upsloping to terrain. What is upslope fog? Upslope fog forms as a result of moist, stable air being cooled adiabatically as it moves upsloping to terrain. Once the upslope wind ceases, the fog dissipates. Upslope fog is often quite dense and extends to high altitudes. Please pay attention to wind shear. Wind shear, you will be asked about this on your check ride, and it is important that you can understand and that you know the hazards and what wind shear is. What is wind shear and where is it likely to occur? Wind shear is defined as the rate of change of wind velocity, direction, and or speed per unit distance, conventionally expressed as vertical or horizontal wind shear. It can occur at any level in the atmosphere, but three levels are of special concern. Wind shear with a low level temperature inversion, wind shear in a frontal zone or thunderstorm, or wind shear in clear air turbulence at high levels associated with a jet stream or strong circulation. Wind shear is of a concern to pilots because unexpected changes in wind speed and direction can be very hazardous to aircraft on final approach at low altitudes and or departing from airports. What type of weather information can you examine to determine if wind shear conditions may be predicted on your flight? You can listen to terminal forecasts, any mention of low-level wind shear, or the possibility of severe thunderstorms, heavy rain showers, hail, and or wind gusts suggest the potential for low-level wind shear and microbursts. You could also tune into METARS, look that up on your pre-flight planning, inspect for any indication of thunderstorms, rain showers, blowing dust. Additional signs such as warning trends, gusty winds, cumulonimbus clouds, etc. should be noted. You could also look at severe weather watch reports like SIGMETs and convictive SIGMETs. You can also check the low-level wind shear alert system if available. They are installed at 110 airports in the U.S. and they're designed to detect wind shifts between outlying stations and a reference counterfeel station. You could also check PIREPS, reports of sudden airspeed changes on departure or approach, and landing corridors provide a real-time indication of the presence of wind shear. Let's move on to obtaining weather information. What is the primary means of obtaining a weather briefing? A flight service station is the primary source of pre-flight weather information. Weather briefings are available via 1-800-WX-BRIEF and 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM. What are some examples of other sources of weather information? Weather and aeronautical information available from numerous private industry sources, such as ForeFlight, Flight Information Services, and Aviation Weather Cameras. What types of weather briefings are available from a flight service station or flight service? What types of briefings are available from a flight service station or an FSS briefer? A standard briefing, abbreviated briefing, outlook briefing, and an in-flight briefing. A standard briefing should be requested when you are planning a flight and you have not received any previous briefing. An abbreviated briefing should be requested when you need information to, to supplement mass disseminated data and or update a previous briefing. An outlook briefing is a request you should make whenever the proposed time of departure is 6 or more hours from the time of the briefing. This is strictly for planning purposes only. You should request an in-flight briefing when you need to update a pre-flight briefing. 
Make sure that on your check ride, you print out your weather briefing and that you highlight all of the important data. That way your examiner knows that you know exactly what to look at and what is important on your charts. What information should a weather briefing include or what should you look at? You should look at adverse conditions, whether or not VFR flight is or is not recommended, current conditions, en route forecast, the destination forecast, the winds aloft, any notams, ATC delays, and make sure that you are aware of the airspaces that you will be flying through. While en route, how can a pilot obtain updated weather information? You can contact Flight Service Station on 122.2 and or an appropriate remote communications outlet frequency. You can listen to ATIS, ASOS, or AWOS broadcasts along your route of flight. You can also listen to ARTCC broadcasts. You could also always ask air traffic control if the workload permits. Make sure that on your check ride, your dem you have make sure that on your check ride you're prepared to demonstrate how you would obtain an in-flight weather briefing and how you would communicate with flight service station if need be. Let's talk about aviation weather reports as well as observations. What is a METAR? A METAR is an hourly surface observation of conditions observed at an airport. Again, a METAR is an hourly surface observation of conditions observed at an airport. What are the basic elements in a METAR? The basic elements of a METAR include a station identifier, date time of report, the wind, visibility, weather phenomena, sky condition, temperature and dew point, altimeter, and remarks. What are terminal aerodrome forecasts or TAFs? A terminal aerodrome forecast or TAF is a concise statement of the expected meteorological conditions significant to aviation for a specified time period within five statute miles. Remember, TAFs are specified time period within five statute miles of the center of the airport's runway complex. You should understand and know how to read METARs and TAFs for your checkride and be able to decipher the raw code. What is the graphical forecast for aviation? The GFA tool is a tool on aviationweather.gov slash GFA, and it is a web-based graphic that can provide observations, forecasts, and warnings that can be viewed from 14 hours to the past to 15 hours in the future. This tool can be handy if you're flying somewhere that does not have any weather reporting. Let's talk about SIGMETs. What is a convective SIGMET? Advisory Circular 00-45 says convective, convective SIGMETs imply severe or greater turbulence, severe icing, and low-level wind shear. They may be issued for any convective situation which the forecaster feels is hazardous to all categories of aircrafts. Remember, convective SIGMETs are issued for all aircrafts. The forecast is valid for up to two hours. It can include a severe thunderstorm due to surface winds greater than or equal to 50 knots, hail at the surface greater than or equal to 3 fourths inches in diameter, tornadoes, embedded thunderstorms, a line of thunderstorms, and thunderstorms producing greater than or equal to heavy precipitation that affects 40% or more of an area at least 3,000 square miles. What is a SIGMET? WS. AIM 7-1-6 says a SIGMET WS advises of weather that is potentially hazardous to all aircraft. Severe icing not associated with thunderstorms, severe or extreme turbulence or clear air turbulence not associated with thunderstorms, widespread dust storms or sandstorms lowering surface visibilities to below 3 miles, and volcanic ash. What is an air met? An air met are advisories of significant weather phenomena that describe conditions at intensities lower than those which require the issuance of SIGMETs. They are intended by use for all pilots in the pre-flight and en route phase of flight to enhance safety. AirMed information is available in two formulas, 
text bulletins, and graphics. They are issued on a schedule basis every six hours, and unscheduled updates and corrections are issued as necessary. AirMets can contain details about IFR, extensive mountain obscurations, turbulence, strong surface winds, icing, and freezing levels. What are the different types of AirMets? There are three AirMet types, Sierra, Tango, and Zulu. Sierra describes IFR conditions. Think S, Sierra, for C. You cannot see because there is IFR conditions. AirMet Tango describes moderate turbulence, sustained surface winds of 30 knots or greater, and or non-convected low-level wind shear. Think T for turbulence. AirMet Zulu describes moderate icing and provides freezing level heights. I do not have a fancy acronym for Zulu. If anyone does, please leave them in the comments down below. What valuable information can be determined from winds and temperatures of law forecasts? You can determine the most favorable altitudes based on winds and direction of flight. You can also determine areas of possible icing, as well as temperature inversions and turbulence. What is a surface analysis chart? Surface analysis charts are analyzed charts of surface weather observations. The chart depicts the distribution of several items, including sea level pressure, the positions of highs, troughs, lows, and ridges, as well as the location and character of fronts and the various boundaries, such as dry lines, outflow boundaries, sea breeze fronts, and convergence lines. The chart is produced eight times daily. Define the different chart terms, LIFR, IFR, MVFR, and VFR. You can reference the Aeronautical Information Manual 7-1-7 states LIFR stands for low IFR with a ceiling of less than 500 feet and or visibility less than one mile. IFR conditions are ceiling 500 to less than 1,000 feet and or visibility one to less than three miles. MVFR being marginal VFR with a ceiling of 1,000 to 3,000 feet and or visibility 3 to 5 miles inclusive. And VFR, the ceiling has to be greater than 3,000 feet and visibility greater than 5 miles. All right, that is going to conclude the weather portion of the Private Pilot ACS. If you find this content useful, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That way I know that somebody is enjoying this video. And that way I know to make more information and more videos and put out more content about similar topics. <clears throat> Without further ado, let's get started with cross-country flight planning. So your, cr your cross-country for your check ride is going to be a specific scenario that your examiner is going to give you. He's going to tell you, okay, we're going to fly from here to here to here. And I need you to figure out a weight and balance calculation. I want you to calculate the time and route. Basically set up a nav log. nav log and do your weight and balance for the exam. So one tool that I use to prove that I know how to do weight and balance is an app on the Apple Store called C172 Performance. I would suggest that you use this app because it calculates flight performance, weight and balance. It'll tell you your en route, destination, and departure times, as well as how much room you even need to land, what your takeoff roll is going to be. Your actual weight, once you type in your weight and balance profile, it is very handy. I found it better than ForeFlight, actually. This was acceptable for me on my check ride. This may or may not be acceptable for you on your check ride, so please take this with a grain of salt. Again, I'm just giving you my experience. C172 Performance, it's a blue logo app, and I found it to be a very useful app. Okay, without further ado, that was a brief of exactly what you're going to do on your cross-country flight planning. Be sure that you know how to do these things on pen and paper because if you don't use an E6B, for example, you don't show up with one and he asks you to re redo it and say your iPad fails, then you might be in some trouble because although electronic flight bags are approved as, your, as a reference to material in the cockpit, it's recommended to have a secondary or backup source of aeronautical information just in case that device fails. So outside of that, be sure that you understand and can locate on a sectional chart airport elevations, airports with rotating beacons, airport with lighting 
services available, alert areas, approach control frequencies, ATIS frequencies, Class B, Class C, Class D, and Class E airspace, both with the 700-foot floor and the 1,200-foot floor, as well as the Class E transition area for instrument approaches or departures, Class G airspace, uh, common traffic advisory frequencies or CTAFs, flight service station frequencies, hard surface runway airports, IFR routes, isogonic lines on charts. Be sure that you can identify military airports as well as military operating areas and training routes, as well as national security areas, non-hard surface runways, non-tower controlled airports, obstructions, parachute jumping areas, part-time lighting, pilot-controlled lighting airports, private airports, prohibited areas, restricted areas, and runway lengths. Other things you may be asked about are Unicom frequencies, VFR waypoints, Victor Airways, visual checkpoints, Vortex VORs, warning areas, and terminal radar service areas if available. Again, this is going to vary from person to person, but your examiner will ask you about several, several one of these things on sectional charts and want to make sure that they know, they, they want to make sure that you know exactly what you're looking at. Be sure to look at everything that's in route on your cross-country flight. What are lines of latitude and longitude? Circles parallel to the equator Parallels of latitude enable us to measure distance in degrees latitude north or south of the equator. Meridians in the longitude are drawn from the north pole to the south pole and to the right angles on the equator. What is magnetic deviation? Magnetic deviation is going to be metals and magnetic fields that influence the aircraft's navigation systems, such as electrical circuits, radios, lights, tools, the engine, Magnetize and metal parts and technology, handheld devices specifically. Pre-flight preparation when it comes to cross-country flight planning. We're going to skip mostly over VORs because VORs are mostly going to be on your instrument check ride. But we're strictly going to stick to performance of cross-country flight planning when it comes to aerodynamics as well. So let's just go ahead and get started. Be sure to reference part 71 for airspace. This was something that I found confusing. It tells you what all the different rules and regulations are regarding airspace. <clears throat> all right. Aerodynamics. What are the four dynamic forces that act on an airplane during all maneuvers? Lift, gravity, thrust, and drag. Be able to explain these to your examiner because he may ask you about them. Lift is the upward acting force. Gravity is the downward acting force. Thrust is the forward acting force. And drag is the backward acting force. In what flight condition are all of these forces equal? In steady state, unaccelerated flight. All of the forces are equal to zero. What is an airfoil? Lift is an airfoil. What is the angle of attack? The angle of attack is the angle between the wing cord line and the direction of the relative wind. It can be changed by the pilot. What is the Bernoulli principle? You will most likely be asked about what this is. I was asked on my check ride what the Bernoulli principle is. The Bernoulli principle is the theory of which the pressure of a fluid decreases at points where the speed of the fluid increases. In the case of airflow, high-speed flow is associated with low pressure and low-speed flow with high pressure. The airfoil of an aircraft is designed to increase the velocity of the airflow above its surface, thereby decreasing pressure above the airflow. Simultaneously, the impact of the air on the lower surface of the airfoil increases the pressure below. This combination of pressure decrease above and increase below produces lift. What are the several factors that are going to affect both lift and drag? The shape of the airfoil, the angle of attack, the velocity of the air, the air density, and the wing area. What is torque effect? Torque effect involves Newton's third law of physics, 
and it says that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. In the airplane, this means that the internal parts and the propeller are revolving in one direction. An equal force is trying to rotate the airplane in the opposite direction. It is greatest when at low air speeds and at high power settings and at high angle of attack. What do you think I'm getting at? I am getting at P factor. That is what I was taught it was called. People call it other things. But in this case, we're just going to call it torque effect because that is the official term for it. What effect does torque reaction have on an airplane on ground and in flight? In flight, torque reaction is acting around the longitudinal axis, tending to make the airplane roll. On the ground, during takeoff roll, an additional turning moment around the vertical axis is induced by torque reaction. So, what are four types of factors that contribute to torque effect? I was asked this on my check ride, so you might as well. So, be sure that you understand and can explain these. The first reaction is torque reaction of the engine and propeller. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The rotation of the propeller from the cockpit to the right tends to roll or bank to the air tends to roll or bank the airplane to the left, which is why your instructor is screaming in your ear to add a right rudder. It is important that you use the rudder pedals on your check ride because neglecting that can lead to a discontinuance. Gyroscopic effect on the propeller also is an action or deflection of a spinning object when a force is applied to the outer rim of its rotational mass. The corkscrewing effect on the propeller slipstream is a high-speed rotation of the airplane propeller resulting in a corkscrewing rotation to the slipstream as it moves rearward. At high propeller speeds and low forward speeds, per, for example in a takeoff, the slipstream strikes the vertical tail surface on the left side, pushing the tail to the right and yawing the airplane to the left. Think of it as a spinning rotational movement around the airplane from the propeller all the way to the horizontal stabilizer. Lastly, the well-known P factor. When an airplane is flying at a high angle of attack, the bite of the downward moving propeller blade is greater than the bite of the upward moving blade. This is due to the downward moving blade meeting the oncoming relative wind at a greater angle of attack than the upward moving blade. Consequently, there is greater thrust on the downward, downward moving blade on the right side, and this forces the airplane to yaw to the left. What is load factor? Load factor is the ratio of the total load supported by the airplane's wing to the actual weight of the airplane and its contents. In other words, it is the load supported by the wings divided by the total weight of the aircraft. Why is this important? Because the obviously dangerous overload that is possible for a pilot to impose on the aircraft structure and because an increased load factor increases the stalling speed and makes stalls possible at a seemingly safe flight speed. What situations may result in load factors reaching the maximum? In level turns, turbulence, like severe vertical gusts and sudden increase in angle of attack, as well as speed, an excess speed. So it's important that you keep your eye on the airspeed all, at all times. What effect does an increase in load factor have on stalling speed? As load factor increases, stalling speed increases. You will most likely be asked about stalling speeds and when the airplane will stall on your check ride. So be sure that you understand that when load factor increases, stalling speed increases. What is maneuvering speed? Maneuvering speed is the maximum speed at which the load limit can be imposed without causing structural damage. Maneuvering speed is not on your airspeed indicator, but it should be somewhere in the cockpit or you should know what the maximum maneuvering speed is. It's important that you don't exceed this speed because it can cause structural damage to your aircraft. So, what causes an airplane to stall? The direct cause of every stall is an excessive angle of attack. You will need to know this for the remainder of your pilot career on this earth. What causes an airplane to stall? The cause of every stall is an excessive angle of attack. Each airplane has a particular angle of attack where the airflow separates from the upper surface of the wing and the stall occurs. What is a spin? 
A spin in a small airplane or glider is a controlled, recoverable, or uncontrolled, possibly unrecoverable, maneuver in which the airplane or glider descends in a helical path while flying at an angle of attack greater than the critical of the angle of attack. Spins occur from aggravated stalls and either a slip or a skid. What causes a spin? The primary cause of an advertent spin is exceeding the angle of attack where applying excessive or insufficient rudder, and to a lesser extent, aileron. When are spins most likely to occur? A stall or a spin can occur in any phase of flight but is most likely to occur in the following situations. An engine failure on takeoff, engine failure on approach to landing, a go-around with full nose-up trim, and a go-around with improper flap retraction. What procedures should be used to recover from a spin? Close the throttle, neutralize the ailerons, apply full opposite rudder, and move the elevator control forward to neutralize position. Remember, pair. Power, aileron, rudder, elevator. Power to idle. Ailerons neutral, rudder opposite, elevator full positive. Once the spin rotation stops, neutralize the rudder and begin applying back pressure to return to level flight. Remember to always reference the aircraft's air flight air remember to always reference the aircraft's POH for the appropriate spin recovery procedure. On your check ride, you may be asked what ground effect is. Ground effect is a condition of improved performance the airplane experiences when it is operating near the ground. A change occurs in a three-dimensional flow pattern around the airplane because the airflow around the wing is restricted by the ground surface. It reduces the wing's upwash, downwash, and wingtip vertices. In order for ground effect to be of significant magnitude, the wing must be close to the ground. So, remember that it is a condition of improved performance. What problems can be caused by ground effect? During takeoff, due to the reduced drag and ground effect, the aircraft may seem capable of takeoff well before the, re well before the recommended takeoff speed. However, the airplane rises off the ground in ground effect with a deficiency in speed, and the greater induced drag may result in a very m marginal climb performance or the inability of the airplane to fly at all. During landing, the height of approximately one-tenth of the wingspan above the surface, drag may be 40% less than the airplane when operating in ground effect. During landing, at a height of approximately one-tenth of a wingspan above the surface, drag may be 40% less than when the airplane is operating out of ground effect. Therefore, any excess speed during the landing phase may result in a significant floating distance. If you ever notice that you float when you're on final approach and then roll out to landing. This is due to ground effect. Let's get straight into weight and balance. All right, so weight and balance is going to be a big part of private pilot. Your examiner is going to want to assess you on your knowledge on knowing how to recalculate fuel and weight calculations. This is going to be very important because once you have your private pilot license, you're basically free to fly wherever you want in the United States. And he's going to want to make sure he she's going to make, want to make sure that you know how to make recalculations and that you're competent in making these decisions. So your examiner may ask you about empty weight, gross weight, useful load, arm, moment, center of gravity, datum. There's a bunch of different terms. So empty weight is the weight of the airframe engines and all the permanently installed equipment and usable fuel. That's the empty weight. You are probably going to deal with the useful load, which is the weight of the pilot, the co-pilot, the passengers, baggage, usable fuel, and drainable oil. And then you're going to use the arm, the moment, and the CG. All of that is going to be used to calculate weight and balance. The, cal the calculations you're going to need, more specifically to not over overcomplicate things for you, is you need to know that weight times your arm equals moment. And you can rearrange that calculation to weight equaling moment divided by arm. Okay, so a way to remember this is to remember wham. Weight times arm equals moment. That's what you're going to want to know. Again, you're going to need to use your POH in accordance to this calculation to be able to understand exactly the, where the arm is in the, your specific aircraft. Because it's different for every airplane where you're trying to calculate the weight to be. Let's talk about what characteristics will be affected of an aircraft when you overload it. 
you're, overall you're going to have a higher takeoff speed, a longer takeoff run, shorter range as in fuel, reduced maneuverability, and most importantly a higher stalling speed as well as a higher landing roll and a higher landing speed. You're also potentially putting yourself at risk for putting excessive weight onto the nose wheel. You don't want to do that. So your examiner may ask you what effect does having a forward center of gravity have on an aircraft's flight characteristics? So the higher the stall speed, uh, the higher stall speed, stalling angle of attack is reached at a higher speed due to an increased wing loading. A slower cruise speed will also be a product of this because you will have increased drag, a greater angle of attack will be required to maintain your altitude because you're heavier. You may be more stable as the center of gravity is farther forward from the center of pressure, which increases longitudinal stability, but greater back elevator pressure might be required, as in you might have a longer takeoff roll and higher approach speeds and problems with the landing flare. Now, the examiner may ask you the residual question of what effect does a rearward center of gravity have on an aircraft's flight characteristics? Having a rearward center of gravity on an aircraft will cause a lower stall speed, as in less wing loading. You will have a higher cruise speed, as in reduced drag and a smaller angle of attack to maintain your altitude, but you will be less stable, as in a stall and spin recovery may be more difficult. This is probably something you're going to be asked. I was asked about this on my exam, okay, so keep that in mind. Your examiner is going to want to know that you probably should not overload your rearward center of gravity on your aircraft because stall and spin recovery will be more difficult. The center of gravity is closer to the center of pressure, which will cause longitudinal instability. Let's move on to basic weights on the aircraft that you should ingrain in the back of your head. Gasoline will weigh 6 pounds as per the U.S. gallon, and oil is going to be 7.5 pounds. You may or may not need to know this, but water is 8.35 pounds per U.S. gallon. Okay, so let's talk about the main elements of aircraft performance, right? Because let's apply the knowledge of weight and balance. So the main elements of takeoff performance are going to be takeoff and landing distances, your rate of climbs, your payloads, your range, your speed, your fuel economy, your maneuverability, and your stability. So what comes into play when it comes to all of these topics that you'll probably get asked about? Air density or density altitude, runway surfaces, upslope or downslopes of runways, weight. So what effect does wind have on aircraft performance, right? That's the basic factor of all aircraft performance. So in the takeoff portion, the effect of a headwind is will allow the aircraft to reach the liftoff speed at a lower ground speed, which will increase the airplane performance by shortening the takeoff distance and increasing the angle of climb. The effect of a tailwind is the aircraft needs to achieve a greater ground speed to lift off speed. So don't take off in a tailwind, guys. You should know that when you're coming in to fly, your approach on an airport, make sure that you do not come in with a tailwind on final approach. You should have a tailwind on your downwind leg. On landing, the effect of wind is identical to its effect on takeoff distance. A headwind will lower ground speed and increase airplane performance by steepening the approach angle and reducing the landing distance. A tailwind will increase the ground speed and decrease performance by decreasing the approach angle and increase the landing distance. All right, let's talk about density altitude. I kind of skipped over that just a second ago. So what effect will an increase in density altitude have on takeoff and landing performance? The four things that the aircraft is affected by the density of the air is the lift produced by the wings, power output of the engine, propeller efficiency, and drag. Those are the four things that will be affected due to density altitude. What factors affect the air density? The three factors that affect air density will be the altitude. The higher the altitude, the less dense the air will be. And when it comes to temperature, the warmer the air, the less dense it is. Humidity, more humid air is less dense. 
Now, please be sure that you understand and that you know the speeds for your airplane. VSO is the stalling speed and landing configuration. VSI is the stall speed clean or in a specified configuration. VY is the best climb speed. And VX is the best angle of climb speed. Best rate of climb speed, VY, is the calibrated arrow speed at which the airplane will obtain the maximum increase in altitude per unit of time. So what I want you guys to remember in VY, okay, when it comes to time, is you're going to imagine that at the very end of the runway, there's just a massive Y, okay? Let's just, let's just picture that, okay? Big runway, massive Y, and you have to make it in between the Y in order to take off from the runway. If you don't take off in as quickly amount, in the quickest amount of time, okay, you have to, you have to, within a specific amount of time, make it between the Y, the top of the Y, in order to clear an obstacle or you won't make it. That's the way I like to remember it. Your instructor may teach you a different way. That's what got me to figure that out. Now for VX, in order to remember the best angle of climb, you can look at the X and remember that the X has two angles, top and bottom, left and right, and just remember angles for X. VLE is maximum landing gear extension speed. VLO is the maximum landing gear operating speed. VFE is maximum flaps extended speed. VA is maneuvering speed. Remember that this is generally not in your airspeed indicator. You're going to have to know beforehand what this speed is by referencing your POH. VNO is normal operating speed. And VNE is never exceed speed. NE, never exceed. All right, let's move on to operations of systems. So what are the four main control surfaces and what are their functions? The four main control surfaces on an airplane are going to be the elevators, ailerons, rudders, and trim. The elevator controls the lateral axis. The motion is called pitch. The ailerons control the airplane's movement about its longitudinal axis. This motion is called roll. The rudder controls the movement of the airplane on a vertical axis, and this is called yaw. And the trim is a small adjustable hinge surface on the aileron rudder or elevator control surface, and they enable the pilot to release manual pressure on the primary control and maintain a desired state of flight. So how are these various flight controls operated? The flight control surfaces are manually actuated through use of a rod or a cable system. What are flaps and what are their functions? The wing flaps are movable panels on the trailing edges of the wings. They are hinged so that they can be extended downward into the flow of the air beneath the wings to increase both lift and drag. Their purpose is to permit a lower airspeed and allow for a steeper angle of descent during a landing approach. In some cases, they can also be used to shorten takeoff distance. Airliners do use that. Describe the landing gear on this airplane. This is referencing a Cessna 172. If you fly a different aircraft, obviously it could be different. The landing gear consists of a tricycle type system utilizing two main wheels and a steer steerable nose wheel. Describe the braking system on this aircraft. Hydraulically actuated disc type brakes are utilized on each main gear wheel. A hydraulic line connects each brake to a master cylinder located on each pilot's rudder pedals. By applying pressure to the top of either the pilot or co-pilot set of rudder pedals, the brakes can be applied. What type of engine does your aircraft have? Go into your POH and please be able to find what kind of engine your aircraft has. If it has been swapped out for a more powerful engine, as most flight schools have opted out to do this, because let's be honest, your trainer aircraft is probably older than you are. Be sure to find exactly what engine your aircraft has and know if it is a horizontally opposed, an overhead valve, 
if it's air cooled, liquid cooled, although most aircraft are both, if it is carbureted, and it if if it is who is manufactured by and how much horsepower it has. So, what are the four types of strokes that an engine has to produce to produce power? The four strokes are the intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Remember, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. I think the acronym is a little weird, but just stick with it. What does the carburetor do? The carburetor can be defined as the process of mixing fuel and air in the correct proportions as to form a combustible mixture. The carburetor vaporizes liquid fuel into tiny particles and then mixes it with the air. How does the carburetor heat system work? The carburetor heat valve controlled by the pilot allows, un allows unfiltered heated air from a shroud located from around the exhaust riser or muffler and can be directed to the induction air manifold prior to the carburetor. Carburetor heat should be used any time suspected or known carburetor icing ex conditions exist. So what happens when you apply carburetor heat? Normally when you apply carburetor heat, the induction of heated air into the carburetor will result into, into a richer mixture. So if your examiner asks, what happens if you apply carburetor heat, you say that it will result in a rich, richer fuel mixture. So what does the throttle do? Well, the throttle regulates the engine speed and power. What does the mixture control do? The mixture control regulates the fuel to air ratio. The purpose of the mixture control is to prevent the mixture from becoming too rich at high altitudes due to decreasing air density and it is also used to lean the mixture during cross-country flights to conserve fuel and provide optimum power. What type of ignition system does your airplane have? Engine ignition is provided by two engine driven magnetos and two spark plugs per cylinder. The ignition system is completely independent of the aircraft electrical system. The magnetos are engine driven, self contained units supplying electrical current without using an external source of current. Before they can produce current, the magnetos must be actuated. So, how do you actuate the magnetos? The engine crankshaft has to be rotated by other means. So to do this, the aircraft battery uses electrical power to operate a starter, which through a series of gears will then rotate the engine crankshaft. This will actuate the magneto to produce the sparks for ignition of the fuel in each cylinder. After the engine starts, the starter system is disengaged and the battery no longer contributes to the actual operation of the engine. So what are the two main advantages of a dual ignition system? This will call for an increased safety in case one system fails, the engine may be operated on the other until you can land the airplane safely. You will have a more complete and even more combustion of the mixture and consequently improved engine performance. You will also have an even combustion of the mixture and consequently improved engine performance. The fuel air mixture will be ignited on each side of the combustion chamber and burned towards the center. So what type of fuel system does your aircraft use? The aircraft in my Cessna 172 as well as all other Cessna 172s from the 90s use a gravity fed system. So if your examiner asks you how is your airplane supplied with fuel? The airplane supplies the engine with fuel by using a gravity fed system. Using gravity, the fuel flows from two wings, from two wing tanks to a fuel shutoff valve, which on the on position allows fuel to flow through the strainer, which then goes through the carburetor. From there, the fuel is mixed with the air and then flows into the cylinders through the intake manifold tubes. What purpose do fuel tank vents have? As the fuel level in an aircraft decreases, a vacuum would be created within the tank which would eventually result in a decreasing fuel flow and finally an engine failure. Fuel system ventilation provides a way of replacing fuel with outside air preventing formation of a vacuum.
What type of fuel does your aircraft require? The aircraft approved fuel for my Cessna 172 is a 100 low lead fuel and the color is blue. Do not put Jet A in your Cessna 172. What is the operation of the manual primer? Or what does the primer knob do? The manual primer's main function is to provide assistance in starting the engine. The primer draws fuel from the fuel strainer and injects it directly into the cylinder intake ports. This will usually result in a quicker, more efficient engine start. Describe the electrical system on your aircraft. Electrical energy is provided by a 28 volt direct current system powered by an engine driven alternator and a 24 volt battery. Remember that the battery must be charged by a alternator that is of higher voltage of the battery itself so that it can always replenish the battery. How are the circuits for the various electrical accessories within the aircraft protected? Most of the electrical circuits are protected by fuses. That's what they're for. That's why you check them before every flight to make sure that something in your airplane has not fried the fuse. The electrical system provides power for what equipment? You will probably have to know this because your examiner may or may not ask you what is powered by the electrical system in your airplane. Normally, as in, in my 70, 172, it will power the radio equipment, the turn coordinator, the fuel gauges, the pitot heat, landing light, taxi light, strobe light, interior light, instrument lights, position lights, and in some cases, the flaps, like my airplane, stall warning systems, maybe, oil temperature gauge, and or the electric fuel pump, if you have one. Be sure to reference your POH to find out what is powered by the battery. What does the amp meter indicate? The amp meter indicates the flow of current in amps from the alternator to the battery or from the battery to the electrical system. Why is it important that the generator alternator voltage output slightly be higher than the battery voltage being used? Again, the difference in voltage will keep the battery charged. If you have a 22 volt battery, it should be supplied with 24 volts. How does the aircraft cabin heat work? The aircraft cabin heat works by adding fresh air heated by the exhaust shroud in the engine bay to then be directed to the cabin through a series of ducts. What are the basic functions of an aircraft engine oil and what's, what does it do? What does the aircraft engine oil do? It lubricates the engine's moving parts. It cools the engine by reducing friction. It removes heat from the cylinders. It provides a seal between the cylinder walls and pistons and it cleans by carrying off metal and carbon particles and other contaminants. Let's talk about system and equipment malfunction situations. So what conditions could be favorable for carburetor icing? Be sure that you understand and know this. Carburetor icing is likely to occur when temperatures are below 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius, and the relative humidity is above 80%. What is detonation? Detonation is an uncontrolled explosive ignition in the fuel-to-air mixture within the cylinder's combustion chamber. It causes excessive temperature and pressure, which if you don't correct, it can quickly lead to failure of the piston, cylinder, or valves. Detonation can be identified by high cylinder head temperatures, or high engine temperatures, and can occur when operating at high power settings. What are the high... What are the highest causes of detonation? Detonation can occur from using a lower fuel grade than specified by the manufacturer, operating with high manifold pressures in conjunction with the low RPM, operating the engine at high power settings with an excessively lean mixture, extended ground operations or steep climbs where cylinder cooling is reduced. So what do you do if detonation is suspected? The first thing you want to do is ensure that the proper grade of fuel was used. Uh, use an enriched fuel mixture as well as a shallow climb angle to increase cylinder cooling during takeoff and climb. 
avoid extended high power steep climbs and develop the habit of monitoring the engine instruments to verify power operation according to procedures established by the manufacturer. Let's talk about another thing that could happen, which is pre-ignition. Pre-ignition will occur when the fuel air mixture ignites prior to the engine operating ignition. Pre-ignition will occur when the fuel to air mixture ignites prior to the engine's normal ignition, resulting in reduced engine power and high operating temperatures. Premature burning is usually caused by residual hotspots in the combustion chamber, often created by small carbon deposits on, the cylinder, on a spark plug. Pre-ignition can also cause severe engine damage because the expanding gases exert excessive pressure on the piston while still on the compression sto stroke. What can you do if pre-ignition is suspected? You can reduce the power, reduce the climb rate, for better cooling, enrich the fuel-to-air mixture, and open the cowl flaps if available on your aircraft. What action should be taken if the amp meter indicates a continuous discharge while in flight? If you are flying and your amp meter is showing negative charge, it is most likely because the alternator has quit producing a charge. So if the alternator circuit breaker can be checked and reset and that doesn't do anything, the alternator should be turned off, pull the circuit breaker, the field circuit will continue to draw power from the battery. All electrical equipment not necessary to flight should be turned off. The battery is now the only source of electrical power, and the flight should be terminated and landing made as soon as possible as this is an emergency. During a cross-country flight, you notice that the oil pressure is low, but the oil temperature is normal. What is the problem and what action should be taken? A low, oil, a low oil pressure in flight could be the result of any one of several problems, the most common being that there is insufficient amounts of oil in the engine. If the oil temperature continues to remain normal, a clogged oil pressure relief valve or oil pressure gauge malfunction could be the culprit. In any case, a landing at the nearest airport is advisable to check for the cause of the trouble. All right, let's talk about the pedostatic flight instruments. What instruments operate off the pedostatic system? The altimeter, the vertical speed, and the airspeed indicator. How does the altimeter work? The altimeter uses a sensitive aneroid barometer that measures the absolute pressure of the ambient air and displays it in terms of feet above a selected pressure level. What are the different types of altitudes? The different types of altitudes are absolute altitude, which is the vertical distance of an aircraft above the terrain, indicated altitude being the altitude read directly from the altimeter after it's set to the current altimeter setting. Pressure altitude is when the altimeter setting window is adjusted to 299 or 2. True altitude is the true vertical distance of the aircraft above sea level, airport, terrain, and obstacle elevations found on aeronautical charts as true altitudes. Density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature variations directly related to an aircraft's takeoff, climb, and landing performance. How does the airspeed indicator operate? The airspeed indicator is a sensitive differential pressure gauge which measures the difference between impact pressure from the pitot head and undisturbed atmospheric pressure from the static source. The difference is registered by the airspeed pointer on the face of the instrument. What are the limitations of the airspeed indicator? The airspeed indicator is subject to proper airflow in the pedostatic system, meaning that if it has insufficient or faulty airflow to it, it could cause failure to show you a accurate reading. What are the different types of aircraft speeds? The different types of aircraft speeds can be indicated airspeed, calibrated airspeed, and true airspeed. Indicated airspeed is the speed of the airplane observed on the airspeed indicator. Obviously, what you see on the airspeed indicator. It's the indicated airspeed. Calibrated airspeed is the airspeed indicator reading corrected for position and instrument errors. True airspeed is, correct, is calibrated airspeed corrected for altitude and non-standard temperature. The speed of the airplane in relation to the air mass in which it is flying. What are the limitations of the vertical speed indicator? 
The vertical speed indicator is not accurate until the aircraft is stabilized. Let's talk about the gyroscopic flight instruments. What instruments are part of the gyroscopic system? The turn coordinator, the heading indicator, the attitude indicator. What are the two fundamental properties of a gyroscope? Rigidity in space. A gyroscope remains in a fixed position in the plane in which it is spinning, as well as precession, the tilting or turning of a gyro in response to a deflective force. What are the various power sources that may be used to power the gyroscopic instruments in an airplane? In some airplanes, all gyros are vacuum, pressure, or electronically operated, or in others, they are split to increase reliability in case one goes out and one does not, you still at least have one or two instruments. How does the vacuum system operate? An engine-driven vacuum pump provides suction which pulls air from the instrument case. Normal pressure entering the case is directed against rotor vanes to turn the gyro at a high speed, like a water wheel or how a turbine operates. Air is drawn into the instrument through a filter for, from the cockpit and eventually vented outside. How does the attitude indicator work? The gyro in the attitude indicator is mounted on a horizontal plane and depends upon rigidity and space for its operation. How does the heading indicator work? The operation of the heading indicator uses the principle of rigidity in space and the rotor turns in a vertical plane. The compass card is fixed to the rotor and since the rotor remains rigid in space, the points on the card hold the same position in the space relative to the vertical plane. As the instrument case and the airplane revolve around the vertical axis, the card provides clear and accurate heading information. How does the turn coordinator operate? The turn part of the instrument uses precession to indicate direction and approximate rate of turn. A gyro reacts by trying to move in reaction to the force applied, thus moving the needle or miniature aircraft in proportion to the rate of turn. The slip skid indicator is a liquid filled tube with a ball that reacts to centrifugal force and gravity. How does the magnetic compass work? The magnetic compass works by utilizing magnetized needles fastened to a float which is mounted on a compass card which is aligned parallel to the earth's lines of magnetic force. The float assembly is housed in a bowl filled with acid free white kerosene. What are the various compass errors? Oscillation error, erratic movement of the compass card caused by turbulence or rough control. Deviation error, due to electrical and magnetic disturbances in the aircraft. And variation error, are angular differences between true and magnetic north. You will also have dip errors. The types of dip errors are acceleration error, on an east or west heading, while accelerating, the magnetic compass shows a turn to the north, and when decelerating, it shows a turn to the south. Remember ANDs. Accelerate north, decelerate south. Another error you may experience are the northerly turning errors. The compass will lead on the south half of the turn and lag on the north half of the turn. Remember UNOS. Undershoot north, overshoot south. All right, so we're going to get into advanced avionics because I have not seen anyone else cover this on YouTube. So I'm just going to give you guys a run through of all the different definitions. And I'll just be more on the basic side because you probably won't be asked a lot about this on your private. I learned on a steam gauge aircraft, so I just went out of my way to find this information for you guys. But if you're interested, listen to this. If not, skip right through this to the next section. What are the following equipment acronyms? AHRS, ADC, PFD, MFD, FD, FMS, INS. AHRS is the Attitude and Heading Reference System. It is composed of three-axis sensors that provide heading, altitude, and yaw information for the aircraft. AHRS are designed to replace traditional mechanical gyroscopic flight instruments and provide superior reliability and accuracy. The ADC is the Air Data Computer. It is an aircraft computer that receives and processes pitot pressure, static pressure, and temperature to calculate precise altitude. PFD. 
The PFD is the primary flight display, a display that provides an increased situational awareness of the pilot by replacing the traditional six instruments with an easy-to-scan display that shows the horizon, airspeed, altitude, vertical speed, trend, trim, rate of turn, and more. The MFD is a multifunction display, a cockpit display capable of presenting information to the pilot in configurable ways, often used in conjunction with a PFD. An FD is a flight director, an electronic flight computer that analyzes the navigation, selection, signals, and aircraft parameters. It presents steering instructions on the flight display as command bars or crossbars for the pilot to position the nose of the aircraft over or follow. The FMS is the flight management system, a computer system containing a database for programming of routes, approaches, and departures that can supply navigational data to flight director autopilot from various sources and can calculate flight data such as fuel consumption, time remaining, possible range, and other values. The INS is Inertial Navigation System, a computer-based navigational system that tracks the movement of the aircraft via signals produced by onboard accelerometers. The initial location of the aircraft is entered into the computer and all subsequent movement is then sensed and used to keep the aircraft's position updated. When powering up an aircraft with an FMS slash RNAV unit installed, how will you verify that the dates on the navigation database are up to date? The effective dates for the navigation database are generally shown on the startup screen that is displayed as the system cycles through its self through its self startup check. What display information will be affected when the air data computer failure occurs? Inoperative airspeed altitude vertical speed indicators shown with red X's on the primary flight display will indicate the failure of the air data computer. What display information will be lost when AHRS failure occurs? An inoperative attitude indicator shown with a red X on the PFD indicates failure of the AHRS. All right, that was a brief description on autopilot. Let's move on to cross-country flight planning and navigation. What are three common ways to navigate? To navigate successfully, pilots must know their approximate position at all times or be able to determine whenever they wish. What are the three common ways to navigate? To navigate successfully, pilots must know their approximate position at all times or be able to determine it whenever they wish. The three methods include pilotage, which is reference to visible landmarks, dead reckoning by computing direction and distance from a known position, or radio navigation by use of radio aids. Be capable of locating and understanding where to find these following items on a sectional chart, as you may be asked this on your check ride. Airport elevation, airports with rotating beacons, airports with lighting facilities, airports with services, alert areas, approach control frequencies, if necessary, ATIS, Class B, Class C, Class D airspaces, as well as their ceilings and bases, Class E airspace, controlled airspace on the 700 foot floor as well as the 1200 foot floor, Class E surface area, Class E transition areas, Class G airspaces, common traffic advisory frequencies, common traffic advisory frequencies, flight service station frequencies, glider operating areas, hard surface versus non hard surface runways, isogonic lines on a chart maximum elevation figures, military airports, operating areas, training routes, national security areas, non-hard surface runways, non-controlled towered airports, as well as towered airports, non-towered airports versus towered airports, obstructions above 1,000 feet AGL as well as below, parachute jumping areas, part-time lighting, pilot-controlled lighting, private prohibited restricted areas and airports as well as runway lengths, unicom frequencies, VFR transition routes, VFR waypoints, Victor Airways, visual checkpoints, vortex, and warning areas.
as well as maybe TRSAs, terminal radar service areas, if available. What is magnetic variation? I already went through that. Your examiner may ask you, what are the lines of latitude and longitude on your sectional chart and why are they relevant? Lines of latitude and longitude are circles parallel to the equator. Parallels of latitude enable us to measure distance in degrees latitude north or south of the equator. Meridians of longitude are drawn from the north pole to the south pole and are at right angles at the equator. From my personal experience on my check ride, all I had to know was that in order to do a check of your VOR and receiver equipment per 14 CFR 91171 is for a VOT check, it would be plus or minus 4 degrees. Your ground check should be plus or minus 4 degrees, and then your airborne check is plus or minus 6 degrees, and your dual VOR check will be 4 degrees between each other. What is GPS? GPS is a satellite-based radio navigation system that broadcasts a signal used by receivers to determine a precise position anywhere in the world. Let's move on to radio communications. What is ATIS? Automatic Terminal Information Service is the continuous broadcast of recorded non-control information in selected high-activity terminal areas. Its purpose is to improve controller effectiveness and to relieve frequency congestion by automating the repetitive transmission of essential but routine information. What is an RCO? A remote communications outlet is an unmanned communications facility remotely controlled by an air traffic control personnel established for the purpose of providing ground-to-ground -ground communication between air traffic control and pilots located at satellite airports. Air traffic control may use the RCO to deliver an en route clearance and departure authorizations. Alright, let's move on to a big, big section. The FAA Federal Aviation Regulations Part 91. What restrictions apply to pilots concerning the use of drugs and alcohol? No person may act or attempt to act as the crew member of a civil aircraft within eight hours after the consumption of any alcoholic beverage. While under the influence of alcohol, while conducting any drug that affects the person's facilities in any way contrary to safety, or while having an alcohol concentration of 0.04% or more in a blood or breath specimen. This is found in 14 CFR 91.17. Is it permissible for a pilot to allow a person who is obviously under the influence to be carried aboard an aircraft? No, except in an emergency. Under what conditions may objects be dropped from an aircraft? 14 CFR 91.15 states that no pilot in command of an aircraft may allow any object to be dropped from the aircraft in flight that creates a hazard to persons or property. Concerning a flight in the local area, is any pre-flight action required, and if so, what must it consist of? Yes. 14 CFR 91.103 states that pilots must familiarize themselves with all available information concerning that flight including runway lengths at the airports of intended use and takeoff landing performance data under the existing conditions. What pre-flight action is required by regulation to all flights away from the vicinity of the departure airport? 14 CFR 91103 states that for a flight under IFR that is not in the vicinity of an airport, you must check the NOTAMS, weather reports forecasts, known air traffic delays, runway lengths at airports of intended use, alternatives available if the planned flight cannot be completed, fuel requirements, as well as takeoff and landing distance data, or NWCRAFT, that is the acronym. Which persons on board an aircraft are required to use seatbelts? Each person on board of a U.S. registered civil aircraft must occupy an approved seat or safety belt if installed, a short shoulder harness as well, and be properly secured about him or her during movement on the surface during the takeoff and landing portions of a flight. What responsibility does the pilot in command have concerning passengers and their use of seatbelts? 
14 CFR 91107 states that no pilot may take off a U.S. registered civil aircraft unless the pilot in command of the aircraft ensures that each person on board is briefed on how to fasten and unfasten that person's safety belt and shoulder harness if installed. If an altimeter setting is not available before the flight, what procedure should be used? 14 CFR 91121 states that the elevation of the departure airport or an appropriate altimeter setting available before departure should be used. When may a pilot intentionally deviate from an air traffic control clearance or instruction? No pilot may deviate from an air traffic control clearance unless an amended clearance has been obtained, an emergency exists, or in response to traffic and collision avoidance system resolution advisories. This is stated in 14 CFR 91.123. What are the fuel requirements for VFR flight at night? 14 CFR 91.151 states that no person may begin flight in an aircraft under VFR conditions unless there is enough fuel to fly to the first point of intended landing and assuming normal cruising speed at night to fly after that for at least 45 minutes. What is the fuel requirement for VFR flight during the day? 14 CFR 91151 states that during the day you must be able to fly to the first point of intended landing and assuming normal cruising speed to fly after that for an, at least another 30 minutes. When operating an aircraft under VFR in level cruising flight at an altitude of more than 3,000 feet above the surface, what rules apply concerning specific altitudes flown? 14 CFR 91159 states that when operating above 3,000 feet AGL but less than 18,000 feet MSL on a magnetic course of 0 degrees to 179 degrees, you must fly an odd thousands foot MSL altitude plus 500 feet. When on a magnetic course of 180 degrees to 359 degrees, you must fly at an even thousand foot MSL altitude plus 500 feet. What is, an, what is an ELT? An emergency locator transmitter is a radio transmitter attached to the aircraft structure which operates from its own power source. It aids in locating down aircraft. It is designed to function without human action after an accident. It can, be oper it can operationally be tested during the first five minutes after any hour. When must the batteries in an emergency locator transmitter be replaced or recharged, if rechargeable? 14 CFR 91207 states that batteries using ELTs must be replaced or recharged if the batteries are rechargeable, when the transmitter has been in use for more than one cumulative hour, or when 50% of its useful life has expired. Note that the new registration Note that the new expiration date for replacing or recharging the battery must legally be marked on the outside of the transmitter and entered in the aircraft maintenance log. This date indicates... Oh, fuck, skip that. What are the regulations concerning the supplemental oxygen on board an aircraft? 14 CFR 91211 states that at cabin pressure altitudes above 12,500 feet MSL, up to and including 14,000 feet MSL, for that part of the flight, at those altitudes that is more than 30 minutes, the required minimum flight crew must be provided with and use supplemental oxygen. At cabin pressure altitudes above 14,000 feet MSL, for the entire flight time at those altitudes, the required flight crew is provided with and uses supplemental oxygen. At cabin pressures above 15,000 feet MSL, each occupant is provided with supplemental oxygen. Let's talk about airspace. Be prepared to explain the type of airspace your planned route of flight will take you through from departure to arrival at your destination. Be sure that you can understand and explain the required visibility, cloud clearance requirements, communi quick communication requirements, and the exact things that you need to have on your airplane on board to make the flight legal. Let's talk about Class A airspace. Class A airspace is an airspace that goes from 18,000 feet MSL up to and including flight level 600. We can go into huge details and depth about airspace, but I'm going to make this very simple for you guys to understand because airspace was very confusing for me, and I don't want to confuse anyone else. What is Class A airspace? Class A airspace is called Class A airspace because it is for adults. 
What is Class A airspace? Generally, Class A airspace extends from 18,000 feet MSL up to and including flight level 600. Can a flight under VFR be conducted within Class A airspace? No, unless otherwise authorized by ATC, each person operating an aircraft in Class A airspace must operate that aircraft under IFR. What is the minimum pilot certification for operations conducted within Class A airspace? 14 CFR 91135 says that the pilot must be at least a private pilot with an instrument rating. What is Class B airspace? Generally, Class B airspace extends from the surface to 10,000 feet MSL surrounding the nation's busiest airports in terms of IFR operations or passenger emplanements. The configuration of each Class B airspace area is individually tailored and some Class B airspaces resemble an upside-down wedding cake. Before operating an aircraft in a Class B airspace, what basic requirement must be met? Arriving aircraft must obtain an air traffic control clearance from the air traffic control facility having jurisdiction for that area prior to operating an aircraft in that airspace. You must be cleared to fly in Class B airspace per 14 CFR 91131. What minimum weather operations are required when conducting VFR flight within Class B airspace? 14 CFR 91155 states that VFR flight operations must be conducted clear of clouds with at least three statute miles of visibility. What is Class C airspace? Class C airspace is generally from the surface to 4,000 feet above the airport elevation, surrounding those airports that have an operational control tower, are serviced by a radar approach control, and have a certain number of IFR operations or passenger emplanements. What are the basic dimensions of Class C airspace? Although the configuration of each Class C airspace is individually ta tailored, the airspace usually consists of a 5 nautical mile radius core surface area that extends from the surface to 4,000 feet above the airport elevation and a 10 nautical mile radius shelf area that extends from 1,200 feet to 4,000 feet above the aircraft above the airport elevation. The outer area radial the outer area radius will be 20 nautical miles. What minimum pilot certification is required to operate within Class C airspace? AIM 3-2-4 states that you only need a student pilot certificate. What minimum equipment is required to operate an aircraft within Class C airspace? 14 CFR 91130, 91215, and 91225 states that unless otherwise authorized by ATC, no person may operate an aircraft within Class C airspace designated for an airport unless that aircraft is equipped with the following. You need a two-way radio, an automatic pressure altitude reporting equipment with mode C capability, and ADS-B out equipment. When operating an aircraft through Class C airspace or to an airport within Class C airspace, what basic requirements must be met? 14 CFR 91130 says that each person must establish a two-way radio communication with the air traffic control facility providing air traffic services prior to entering the airspace and thereafter maintain those communications while within that airspace. What minimum weather conditions are required when conducting a VFR flight operation within Class C airspace? VFR flight operations within Class C airspace require three statute mile flight visibility and cloud clearances of at least 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and 2,000 feet horizontal to clouds. This is stated in 14 CFR 91155. How is Class C airspace depicted on a navigational chart? You will find Class C airspace highlighted with a solid magenta line, and it is used to depict Class C airspace. Class C airspaces are depicted by airspaces with a solid magenta line. Where is mode C transponder equipment required? Where is a mode C, where are you required to use mode C and ADS-B out equipment? In general, you will need to use mode C and ADS-B out equipment in class Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie airspace. What is class D airspace? Class D airspace extends upwards from the surface to 2,500 feet above the airport elevation. Surrounding those airports, they have an operational control tower. 
The configuration of each class, the airspace is individually tailored, and when instrument procedures are published, the airspace will normally be designed to contain those procedures. When operating an aircraft through Class D airspace or to an airport within a Class D airspace, what requirement must be met? 14 CFR 91.129 and 91.225 states that each person must establish two-way radio communications with the air traffic control facilities, providing air traffic services prior to entering the airspace and thereafter maintain those communications while in that airspace. Remember that ADSB out equipment is not required in Class D airspace, provided that the Class D airspace is not, not located within 30 nautical miles of mode C fail. What minimum weather conditions are required when operating VFR flight operations within Class D airspace? VFR flight conditions are going to be three 152s, three statute miles flight visibility, 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, and 2,000 feet horizontally to clouds. What type of air traffic control services are provided when operating in Class D airspace? No separation services are provided to VFR aircraft. When meteorological conditions permit, regardless of the type of flight plan or whether or not the control or radar facility, the pilot is responsible to see and avoid other traffic, as well as terrain and other obstacles. A controller will provide radar information, safety alerts, and traffic information for sequencing purposes. If you've ever flown in Class D airspace, you'll notice that the controller will tell you traffic, 2 o'clock, 2 miles, and he'll ask you to report them in sight. What is the definition of controlled airspace? Controlled airspace is airspace of defined dimensions within which air traffic control service is provided to IFR flights and to VFR flights in accordance with airspace classification. Controlled airspace is a generic term that covers class A, B, C, D, and E airspace. What are the types of E airspaces? AIM 3-2-6 states that the different types of class E airspaces are surface area designated for an airport where a control tower is not in operation, extensions to surface areas, airspace used for transition instrument procedures, Federal Airways and Low Altitude RNAV routes, but we're going to ignore the rest because they are not relevant to the private pilot ACS. What is the definition of Class G airspace? Class G or uncontrolled airspace is a portion of the airspace that has not been designated as Class A, B, C, D, or E airspace. It is airspace in which air traffic control has no authority or responsibility to control air traffic. However, pilots should remember that VFR minimums apply to this airspace. So what is the minimum cloud clearance and visibility required when conducting flight operations in a traffic pattern at night in Class G airspace below 1,200 feet AGL? 14 CFR 91.155 says that when the visibility is less than 3 statute miles, but not less than 1 statute mile during night hours, an airplane may be operated clear of clouds if operated in an air airport traffic pattern within one half mile of the runway. Let's talk about flight visibility and clearance from clouds required for VFR flight. What minimum flight visibility and clearances from clouds are required for VFR flight in the following situations? 14 CFR 91155 states that in class C, D, or E airspace at less than 10,000 feet MSL, you must have a visibility of three statute miles, a cloud clearance of 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally. Above 10,000 feet MSL, it will be five statute miles visibility, 1,000 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and one statute miles horizontally. In class G airspace, 1,200 feet or less above the surface, regardless of the MSL altitude. During the day will be one statute mile visibility and clear of clouds. At night, it will be three statute miles of visibility with a cloud clearance of three 152s, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontal. And at more than 1,200 feet above the surface, but less than 10,000 feet MSL, the day visibility will have to be one statute mile, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontal. And at night, the visibility will be three statute miles, 
with Cessna 152, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontal, and at more than 1,200 feet above the surface and at or above 10,000 feet MSL, visibility of five statute miles, a cloud clearance of 1,000 feet below, 1,000 feet above, one statute miles horizontally. What is a prohibited area? Prohibited areas contain airspace where flight of aircraft is prohibited. These areas are established for security or other reasons associated with national welfare. What is a restricted area? Restricted areas contain airspace identified by an area on the surface of the earth where the flight of the aircraft is subject to restrictions. These areas denote the existence of of unusual, often invisible, hazards to aircraft such as artillery firing, aerial gunnery, or guided missiles. Penetration of restricted areas without authorization from the using or controlling agency can be extremely hazardous to all aircraft. Under what condition, if any, may pilots enter restricted or prohibited areas? No person may operate an aircraft within a restricted area contrary to the restrictions imposed or within a prohibited area unless that person has the permission of the using or controlling agency. A warning area. What is a warning area? A warning area is an airspace of undefined dimensions extending from three nautical miles outward of the coast of the U.S. containing activity that may be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. The purpose of such areas is to warn non-participating airports of the potential danger. A warning area may be located over domestic or international waters, or both. What is an MOA? A military operating area consists of an airspace of defined vertical and lateral limits established for the purpose of separating military training activities from traffic. Pilots on operating under VFR should exercise extreme caution while flying within an MOA when military activity is being conducted. What is an alert area? An alert area is depicted on an aeronautical chart to perform what is an alert area? Alert areas are depicted on aeronautical charts to inform non-participating pilots of areas that may contain high volumes of pilot training or unusual type of aerial activity. Pilots should be particularly alert when flying in these areas. What are MTRs, or military training routes? Military training routes are developed for use for military for the purpose of conducting low altitude and high speed training. The routes above 1500 feet AGL are developed to be flown to the maximum extent possible under IFR. Let's briefly go over the NTSB or the National Transportation Safety Board. You may or may not be asked about this on your check ride, but just in case you do, let's just go over some brief things about it that you may have to know for your check ride. NTSB part 830 talks about all the different information, including general aviation pilots. So when is an immediate notification to the NTSB required? NTSB part 830.5 says that the operator of an aircraft shall immediately notify the nearest NTSB off office when an aircraft accident or any of the following incidents occur. Keyword incidents. I'll get into that in a second. Flight control system malfunction, a crew member unable to perform normal duties, an in-flight fire, a collision in flight, property damage, or release of a portion of propeller blade from an aircraft, as well as complete loss of information for more than 50% of the aircraft cockpit displays. So what is an aircraft incident defined by the NTSB? The NTSB part 830.2 830.2 says that an aircraft incident means that an occurrence other than an accident associated with the operation of an aircraft which affects or could affect the safety of the operations. An accident means that an occurrence associated with the operation of an aircraft which takes place between the time any person boards the aircraft with the intention of flight and all persons have disembarked and in which any person suffers death or serious injury in which the aircraft receives substantial damage. Okay, so the accident is actual substantial damage to a person or an aircraft. So what is a serious injury defined by the NTSB? A serious injury means any injury that requires hospitalization for more than 48 hours, results in a fracture of any bone, 
causes severe nerve, muscle, or tendon damage, involves any internal organ, or involves a second or third degree burn affecting more than 5% of the body surface. So what does it mean by substantial damage? Substantial damage means damage or failure which advertly affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of the aircraft and would require major repair or replacement of the affected component, like the engine prop or a wing. That's pretty much all you will most likely have to know when it comes to the NTSB for your private pilot checkride. You may have to get more into that later on in your ratings, like commercial or ATP, not really too sure. Again, it will vary on your examiner. Let's talk about the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual. Be sure that you obtain the FARAM app on your iPad because it updates on its own every year and you don't have to continue to buy books and tab it out. You can quickly quick search everything. I'm not sponsored by the ASA or anything. I'm just giving you a suggestion because it's easier and you can have your answer in a few seconds. What does the operation of an airport rotating beacon during the hours of daylight indicate? In the AIM 2-1-10, it states that in class B, C, D, and E surface areas, operations of an airport beacon during the hours of daylight indicate that the ground visibility is less than 3 miles and or the ceiling is less than 1,000 feet. Air traffic control clearance is required in accordance with Part 91 for landing, takeoff, and flight in the traffic pattern in these conditions. Let's talk about the six types of signs that are generally installed at airports. A mandatory instruction sign will be seen in a red background with a white inscription. It will denote an entrance to a runway, a critical area, or a prohibited area. A location sign where you're currently located will have a black background with a yellow inscription or a yellow border. They don't have arrows and they're used to identify a taxiway or a runway location the boundary of a runway, or identify an ILS critical area. A directional sign will have a yellow background with a black inscription, and it will identify the designation of intersecting taxiways leading out of an intersection that a pilot would expect to turn onto or hold short of. A destination sign will show a yellow background with a black inscription and also contain arrows. It will provide information on locating runways, terminals, cargo areas, and civil aviation aircrafts. An information sign will show a yellow background with a black inscription used to provide the pilot with information on areas that can't be seen from the control tower, applicable radio frequencies, and procedures. The runway distance remaining sign, obviously, is going to have a black background, white numeral inscriptions, and it will indicate the distance of the remaining runway in thousands of feet. What color are runway markings and what color are taxiway markings? Markings for runways are white, and markings for taxiways, areas intended for use of aircraft, and holding positions will be yellow. What are the different types of airport marking aids? The runway threshold markings consist of eight longitudinal stripes of uniform dimensions disposed symmetrically about a runway centerline. A threshold marking helps identify the beginning of a runway available for landing. A displaced threshold is a threshold located on, at a point of the runway other than the designated beginning of the runway, and a displaced threshold reduces the length of the runway available for landings. The portion of runway behind a displaced threshold is available for takeoffs in either direction. Usually, there's a 10-foot wide white threshold bar located across the width of the runway at the displaced threshold. White arrows located along the center line of the area between the beginning of the runway and the displaced threshold are located on the width of the runway just prior to the threshold bar. What do the runway hold position markings mean? For taxiways, these markings identify the locations on a taxiway where the aircraft must stop when a clearance has not been issued to proceed onto the runway. Generally, runway holding position markings also identify the boundary of the runway safety area for aircraft exiting the runway. Usually, they consist of four yellow lines, two solid and two dashed, spaced six inches apart and extending across the width of the taxiway or runway. A temporary closed runway and taxiway 
will provide a visual indication to pilots with a yellow cross placed on the runway only at each end of the runway. Closed, run closed taxiways are blocked with barricades or may utilize a yellow cross at the entrance of a taxiway. What are the standard direction of turns when approaching to an uncontrolled airport for a landing? When approaching for a landing, all turns must be made to the left unless a traffic pattern indicator indicates that turns should be made to the right. What is considered the standard for traffic pattern altitudes? Propeller-driven aircraft enter the traffic pattern at 1,000 feet AGL per 14 CFR 91155. If you're ever in doubt about the traffic pattern altitude for a particular airport, you can check the U.S. chart supplement. What are the different transponder codes? 1200 VFR operations, 7500 hijack, 7600 communications failure, and 7700 for emergency. What are NOTAMs? Notice to airmen are time-critical aeronautical information of either a temporary nature or permanent nature. NOTAMs must be checked before a flight, and this is information that could affect a pilot's decision to make the flight. It includes information as an airport or primary runway closures, changes in status of navigational aids, radar service availabilities, and other information essential to planned and route, terminal, or landing operations. Pilots can access NOTAM information via flight service station or online via NOTAM search at NOTAMs aim.faa.gov slash NOTAM search. Where can NOTAM information be obtained? Again, you can call the flight service station or do a NOTAM search on notams.aim.faa.gov slash NOTAM search. You can also look on the FSS briefing website, 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM. What is wake turbulence? Wake turbulence in the AIM glossary states that it is a phenomenon resulting in the passage of an aircraft to the atmosphere. The, ter the term includes vortices, thrust stream turbulence, jet blast, jet wash, propeller wash, and rotor wash, both on the ground and in the air. It is likely to happen when the strength of an aircraft generating this is heavy, clean, and slow. You may have learned this on your private pilot ground school course. Let's talk about runway incursion avoidance. Pre-flight planning for taxi operations should be a critical part of the pilot's flight planning process. What kind of information should this pre-flight planning include? Advisory Circular 91-73 states that you should review and understand airport signage, markings, and lighting, as well as review the airport diagram, plan taxi route, and identify any hotspots. You should also review the latest NOTAMs and ATIS, conduct a pre-taxi pre-landing briefly, that includes the expected and assigned taxi routes and any hold short lines and restrictions, plan for critical times and locations on the taxi route, and plan to complete as many aircraft checklist items as possible prior to taxi to avoid congestion. So what's an airport hotspot? A hotspot is a safety-related problem area or intersection on an airport. Typically, hotspots are complex or confusing taxiway to taxiway or taxiway to runway intersections. A lack of visibility can exist at certain points, and the tower may, una may be unable to see those particular intersections. Pilots should be increasingly vigilant when approaching and taxiing in these intersections. Hotspots are depicted on airport diagrams as circles or polygons des designated as HS1 or HS2 or HS3, depending on how many there are. Hotspots can generally be found in the chart supplement. Why is a sterile cockpit important when conducting taxi operations? Again, reference advisory circular 91-73. It states pilots must be able to focus their duties without being distracted by non-flight related maneuvers. Remember that your examiner will purposefully try to distract you on your check ride by asking you questions. They could be personal. They could be something that you're interested in. Just remember to remain a sterile cockpit. What are some recommended practices that can assist a pilot in maintaining situational awareness during taxi operations? The use of all available resources, such as airport diagrams, airport signs, markings, lighting, and air traffic control to keep the aircraft on its assigned taxi route, as well as cross-referencing the heading indicator to ensure turns are being made in the correct direction and that you're on the assigned taxi route. 
Prior to crossing any hold short line, visually check for conflicting traffic as well as verbalizing clear left, clear right. Be alert for other aircraft with similar call signs on the frequency and understand and follow all traf air traffic control instructions and if in doubt, always ask. How can a pilot use aircraft exterior lighting to enhance situational awareness and safety during operations on the surface? Before turning on your engines, be sure to turn on your beacon. When you're taxiing prior to commencing, turn on your navigation and positional lights as well as your anti-collision lights. When you're crossing a runway, all exterior lights should be on when crossing a runway to help everyone else that is around see you. Let's talk about night operations. So the FAA requires you to have three hours of night operations before being able to take your check ride. What can the pilot do to improve the effectiveness of vision at night? The pilot can adapt the eyes to darkness prior to flight and keep them adapted. About 30 minutes is needed to adjust after exposure to a bright light. What equipment should the pilot have for night flight operations? The pilot should have at least one reliable flashlight, a standard equipment, as well as a light being able to produce a red or a blue light for chart reading. You should also have a second flashlight, like a head-mounted type, as a backup. Position lights are required to be on during what period of time? 14 CFR 91209 states that you should have your position lights on from sunset to sunrise. What are the different definitions of night? Now, this is where people get confused, so I'm going to explain each, all three of them and tell you where to find them in the frame. 14 CFR 1.1 says that the time between the end of evening civil twilight and the beginning of morning civil twilight as published by the Air Almanac converted to local time. Use this definition when logging night flight time. Again, the time between the end of civil twilight and the beginning of morning civil twilight is the definition of logging night flight time. Now, 14 CFR 6157 states that the beginning one hour after sunset and ending one hour before sunrise is the definition of night. You are to use this definition when determining currency to act as pilot and command of an aircraft carrying passengers. Again, to log currency for carrying passengers, it will be one hour after sunset and one hour before sunrise. 14 CFR 91209 says that the period of sunset to sunrise is the definition to determine when you are required to have position and anti-collision lights on. During your pre-flight, what things should be done to adequately prepare for the flight? Prior to a night flight, you should study all weather reports and forecasts. You should pay particular attention towards temperature and dew point spreads that can detect the possibility of fog formation, as well as calculate wind directions and speeds along the route of flight to ensure accurate drift calculations, as night visual perception of drift is generally very inaccurate compared to daytime. You should obtain applicable aeronautical charts for both the proposed route as well as adjacent charts, and mark lighted checkpoints clearly. Review all radio navigational aids for correct frequencies and availability. And if a GPS is being used for navigation, ensure that it is working properly before the flight and that it is updated. Check all personal equipment such as flashlights and portable transceivers for proper operation. Make sure your headset has batteries. Make sure your, ba your flashlight has batteries and that your iPad is sufficiently charged or whatever you're using to navigate. The aircraft should be thoroughly pre-flighted and all aircraft position lights as well as the landing light and rotating beacon should be checked for proper operation. Ground areas should also be checked for obstructions that may not be readily visible from within the cockpit to make sure that you don't start the aircraft in a place you shouldn't be doing it at. Let's talk about the scariest thing you could probably encounter. If an engine failure occurs at night, what procedure should be followed? If the engine fails at night, the same procedures apply for dealing with the situation in the daytime. Maintain positive control of the airplane and don't panic. A normal glide should be established and maintained as the aircraft is turned towards an airport or away from congested areas. A check should be made to determine the cause of the engine failure, such as the position of magnetos, fuel selectors, or primer. If unsuccessful in restart procedures, select 7700 on the transponder 121.5 on your radio and declare an emergency stating who you are, where you are, and what your intentions are. 
in some cases where radar is available, such as approach control or center, you could obtain a quick vector to the nearest airport if within gliding distance. If you've done your homework, you plan your route of flight within gliding distance of lighted airports. If not, two possibilities exist for landing areas. You could try to reach lighted areas, such as interstate highways, roads, parking lots. The advantages include being able to see where and what you're landing on and having a relatively improved surface to land on, but the disadvantages include all kinds of obstructions to deal with, such as traffic poles and overhanging wires and cars. When it comes to unlighted areas, dark areas with relatively few lights indicating an open area such as a field or a lake. Advantages include few or no obstructions to deal with, but the disadvantages include not being able to see what you have selected to land on until illumination by your landing light, if it's working. Whatever your decision, maintain positive control of the aircraft all the way down. A controlled crash will always be more survivable than an uncontrolled crash. Let's talk about human factors. You will be asked about this on your check ride. What is hypoxia? AIM 8-1-2 states that hypoxia is a state of oxygen deficiency in the body sufficient to impair the functions of the brain and other organs. What are the four forms of hypoxia? Hypoxic hypoxia is any condition that interrupts the flow of O2 into the lungs. This is the type of hypoxia encountered at altitude due to the reduction of partial pressure of O2. Hypemic hypoxia is any condition that interferes with the ability of the blood to carry oxygen such as anemia, bleeding, or carbon monoxide poisoning, smoking, or certain prescription drugs. Stagnant is any situation, stagnant hypoxia is any situation that interferes with the normal circulation of the blood arriving to the cells, such as heart failure, shock, and positive G-forces could induce this condition. Histotoxic hypoxia is any condition that interferes with the normal utilization of O2 in the cell. Alcohol or narcotics can all interfere with the cell's ability to use the oxygen in support of metabolism. Where does hypoxia usually occur and what symptoms might you expect? Again, reference AIM 8-1-2. Although deterioration in night vision occurs at cabin pressure altitude as low as 5,000 feet, other significant effects of altitude hypoxia usually do not occur in the normal healthy pilot below 12,000 feet. From 12,000 to 15,000 feet of altitude, judgment, memory, alertness, and coordination and ability to make calculations are impaired and headache, drowsiness, dizziness, and, other, and either a sense of well-being or belligerence occur. Effects are worse above 15... Let's start over. Where does hypoxia usually occur and what symptoms should one expect? Hypoxia usually does not occur in the normal healthy pilot below 12,000 feet, but from 12,000 to 15,000 feet of altitude, judgment, memory, alertness, and coordination, as well as the ability to make calculations, are impaired, and headache, drowsiness, dizziness, and either a sense of well-being or belligerence occurs. Effects worsen above 15,000 feet. What is hyperventilation? Hyperventilation or an abnormal increase in the volume of air breathed in and out of the lungs can occur subconsciously when a stressful situation is encountered in flight. This results in a significant decrease in the carbon dioxide content of the blood and, a carbon, and carbon dioxide is needed to automatically regulate the breathing process. Hyperventilation is an excess of breathing and it can be reversed within a few minutes after the rate of depth of breathing are consciously brought back to normal. The buildup of carbon dioxide in the body can be hastened by controlling breathing in and out of a paper bag held over the nose and mouth. What is carbon monoxide poisoning? Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas contained in exhaust fumes. When inhaled, even in minute quantities over a period of time, it can significantly reduce the ability of blood to carry oxygen. Consequently, the effects of hypoxia will occur. How does carbon monoxide poisoning occur, and how should these and what symptoms should the pilot be alerted? How does carbon monoxide poisoning occur, and what symptoms should a pilot be alert for? Most heaters in light aircraft work by air flowing over the manifold. The use of these heaters while exhaust fumes are escaping through manifold cracks and seals is responsible every year for several non-fatal and fatal aircraft accidents 
from carbon monoxide poisoning. A pilot who detects the odor of exhaust or experiences symptoms of headache, drowsiness, or dizziness while in the heater, while using the heater, should suspect carbon monoxide poisoning. What should be taken if pilot sus suspects carbon monoxide? What action should be taken if the pilot suspects carbon monoxide poisoning? A pilot who suspects this condition should immediately shut off the heater and open all of the air vents to help ventilate the odor or the gas. What is the cause of motion sickness and what are its symptoms? Motion sickness is caused by a continuous stimulation of the inner ear, which controls the sense of balance. The symptoms are progressive and include a loss of appetite, saliva collecting in the mouth, persp perspiration, nausea, disorientation, headaches, and possible vomiting. The pilot may become incapacitated if it becomes severe enough. What action should be taken if a pilot or his passenger suffers from motion sickness? If suffering from air sickness while piloting an aircraft, open up the air vents, loosen the clothing, use supplemental oxygen, and keep the eyes on a point outside the airplane. Avoid unnecessarily un avoid unnecessary head movements and terminate the flight and land as soon as possible. Define single pilot resource management. SRM is the art and science of managing all of the resources, both onboard the aircraft and from outside sources, available to a single pilot. Some of the examples of and some of the examples of skills necessary for effective single pilot resource management include task management, risk management, automation management, controlled flight into terrain awareness, and situational awareness. What are the basic steps in the decision making process? The simple steps in the decision making process are to define the problem, choose a course of action, implement the decision, and evaluate the outcome. What are the five hazardous attitudes that can affect a pilot's ability to make sound decisions and properly exercise authority? Anti-authority. Follow the rules. They are usually right. Impulsivity. Think first, not so fast. Invulnerability. It could happen to me. Macho. Taking chances is foolish. Resignation. I can make a difference. I am not helpless. What is the first step towards neutralizing a hazardous attitude? Recognition of hazardous thoughts is the first step towards neutralizing them. After recognizing a thought as hazardous, the pilot should label it as hazardous and then state the corresponding attitude. Let's talk about risk management. Risk management is the decision-making process designed to systematically identify hazards, assess the degree of it, and determine the best course of action. A hazard is a present condition, event, or object, or circumstance that could lead or contribute to an unplanned or undesired event such as an accident. What are several examples of aviation hazards? A nick in a propeller blade that goes unnoticed or un unacknowledged, improper refueling of an aircraft, pilot fatigue, use of unapproved hardware on aircraft, and weather. How can the pilot use the PAVE checklist during flight to help you assess risk? The pilot in command should acknowledge general health, physical, mental, emotional states, and proficiency as well as currency. A, as in aircraft, airworthiness, equipment, performance capabilities. V, as environment for weather hazards, terrain, airport runways to be used, and conditions. And E, for external pressures, meetings of people, waiting at destinations, as well as desire to impress somebody, or social pressure. Explain the use of I'm safe to determine personal risks. I'm safe stands for illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, emotions. Illness, do I have any symptoms? Medication, have I been taking prescription or over-the-counter drugs? Stress, am I under psychological pressure from my job? Do I have money, family, or health problems? Alcohol, have I been drinking within 8 hours, within 24 hours? Fatigue, am I tired or not adequately rested? Emotions, am I fully recovered from any extremely upsetting events? Define the term task management. Task management is the process by which pilots manage the many concurrent tasks that must be performed to safely and efficiently operate an aircraft. What are the several factors that can reduce a pilot's ability to manage workload effectively? Environmental conditions such as temperature and humidity extremes, as well as noise, vibration, and lack of oxygen. Psychological stress can Psychological stress such as fatigue, lack of physical fitness, sleep loss, and missed meals. This could lead to low blood sugar levels and illness. Psychological stress such as social emotional factors such as death in the family, a divorce, a sick child, a demotion at work, 
This type of stress can also be related to mental workloads, such as analyzing a problem, navigating an aircraft, or making decisions. What are several options a pilot can employ to decrease workload and avoid being overloaded? Stop, think, slow down, and prioritize what you're doing. What is one method of prioritizing tasks to avoid an overload situation? During any situation, and especially an emergency, remember the phase, aviate, navigate, and communicate. What is one method of prioritizing tasks to avoid an overload situation? During any situation, and especially in an emergency, remember the phrase, aviate, navigate, and communicate. When and what phases of flight should a prepared checklist be used? You should use a checklist during the pre-flight inspection, before engine start, engine starting, before taxiing, before takeoff, after takeoff, cruise, descent, before landing, after landing, engine shutdown, and securing. What are several recommended methods for managing a checklist accomplishment? The pilot should touch each point at each control, display or switch, verbally state the desired status of the checklist item, and when complete, announce that XYZ checklist is complete. Let's talk about situational awareness. What is situational awareness? Situational awareness is the accurate perception and understanding of all the factors and conditions within five fundamental risk elements. The flight, pilot, aircraft, environment, and external pressures that affect safety before, during, and after the flight. What are several factors that reduce situational awareness? Factors that reduce situational awareness induce, include fatigue, distractions, unusual or unexpected events, complacency, high workload, unfamiliar situations, and inoperative equipment. For those of you who have stuck around to the end of the video, thank you so much. I've spent quite a lot of time talking into this microphone, a lot of redos, a lot of mess-ups, but here we are. Here we are. So let's go over some scenario-based questions. Again, if you made it this far in the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content. I plan on continuing to make content all right, so you have a good friend, and he asks you to fly as a safety pilot in his retractable gear Piper Arrow while he practices flight by reference to instruments. What regulations require you to be able to act as a safety pilot? In order for you to correctly answer this, you should know safety pilot requirements, currency requirements to carry passengers, and the requirements for a complex endorsement as it is a retractable gear aircraft. You must have at least a private pilot certificate, have endorsed as PIC in a complex airplane, hold a, medical, hold a valid medical certificate, and have satisfactorily met the requirements of a flight review, and logged at least three takeoffs and landings in the preceding 90 days to carry passengers. What personal items do you have to take to ensure that you were legal for this flight, carrying me as your passenger? Your examiner may ask you that. A pilot certificate, photo ID, and a current medical certificate. These must be available in the cockpit when flying. You should verify the logbook that the following were completed. A flight review within the, perceive, within the, within the preceding 24 calendar months, three takeoffs and landings within the previous 90 days, and to a full stop if at night. Let's talk about the airplane. So how do you know that the airplane is airworthy? The airplane's airworthiness involves three different levels of verification. The airworthiness certificate proves that the aircraft was manufactured in compliance with regulations. The maintenance technician having an inspector authorization or an IA certificate certifies the airworthiness at least annually by statement upon completion of the annual inspection. And the pilot certifies airworthiness and is the final authority before each flight with a thorough pre-flight inspection and inspection status review. Your examiner may ask you, prove to me the airplane is airworthiness for our flight today. Include the required inspections, documents, and instrument equipment, such as your statement that the pre-flight inspection shows the aircraft to be satisfactory. So be sure that you have all of these documents printed out and highlighted and that you can quickly show your examiner the aircraft documents and papers. Have your airworthiness certificate printed out, as well as your registration, your operating limitations, your weight and balance data that is current. Regarding the aircraft maintenance records, make sure that the annual inspection was completed within the 12 calendar months. 
a 100 hour inspection was completed. The transponder inspection was completed within the 24 calendar months. The ELT battery is current and the system was inspected within the previous 12 months. Airworthiness directives are complied with and that outstanding maintenance discrepancies have been checked and the status of inoperative equipment verified. So today you plan across country. Show me your true course and what items you considered when choosing this course. There will always be multiple right answers for situational questions, but you could say something along the lines of terrain. I considered extreme high terrain or areas of dense forest with no possible emergency landing areas. You chose checkpoints that are easily to, easy to see and identify. You chose navigation and communication reception routes and that you considered airspaces that you will be flying through as well as weather. Your examiner may ask you, along your course until landing, talk to me through the different airspaces that we will fly through and what implications each one has on our flight. You can use the sectional chart and begin with the airspace surrounding your departure airport and then proceed along your route describing each airspace area as you come to it and how may it may impact your flight. So if you're flying from class D airspace to a class D airspace and you encounter a class C airspace throughout, be sure to explain what your procedure will be throughout that. You should also be able to explain the altitude you selected for your course. You should consider terrain clearances, make sure that you're high enough to exceed minimum safe altitudes, your cloud clearances, make sure it meets the requirements, the direction of flight complies with regulations, your airspace that you stay clear of any airspace that you'd rather not fly close into, such as TFRs, prohibited or restricted areas. Make sure that you also have factored in favorable winds, like a suitable altitude that allows you to exceed, to exercise the most favorable ground speed. An altitude that allows you to see visual checkpoints easier and is best for aircraft performance, such as economic fuel bore economic fuel burn, and that you've also implemented your personal minimums, such as an altitude being comfortable that you fly at. Your examiner may ask you, looking at your nav long, how did you calculate fuel requirements? Here you need to demonstrate the ability to use performance charts and graphs located in the POH. To calculate precisely and add a safety margin at the end, remember to apply personal minimums. So for your fuel requirements, you should have calculated fuel required to start, run up and taxi, fuel for takeoff and climb, the chosen power setting and its associated fuel flow for the duration of cruise, as well as plus 30 minutes for required fuel reserve as your check ride will be during the day. Whenever you're planning a cross country that will include a fuel stop, what factors should you implement in selecting the airport as a stop? Here you need to demonstrate your ability of implementing aeronautical decision making. When you select an airport for a fuel stop, important factors to consider are the airport airspace, the runways, the lengths in relation to the wind, the size of the airport, not too small but not so big that the amount of type of traffic is intimidating, as well as amenities. Do they have restrooms, loaners, restaurants at the airport, as well as the price of fuel or method of payment. Your examiner may ask you, are the runways that you plan to use today at the airport or expected to use, are they suitable for our aircraft? Here you need to demonstrate your ability to use the performance tables in your aircraft's POH and be able to understand that the takeoff and landing performance charts that you calculated will be sufficient to take off and land the aircraft. Here you can also implement your personal minimums, so add 50% of whatever your safety margin is to your calculations to determine runway suitability. Your examiner may ask you, during our flight today, who will you be communicating with? Here you need to demonstrate your knowledge of the available resources and how to use them, such as talking to ground, tower, and departure if departing from a controlled airport, as well as Unicom or Multicom at an uncontrolled airport or CTAF, as well as en route flight following to assist in knowing about pop-up terminal flight restrictions temporary flight restrictions and assist with traffic avoidance, as well as the def destination airport communications as appropriate, such as talking to approach controller within a certain distance of the airport, which you will have to do if you're flying in a class C airspace, which is how my check ride went, be able to explain that they're going to hand you off to the controller and then to the ground, and then they'll tell you what to do. 
your examiner is for sure going to ask you, how did you obtain weather information for our flight? You could say that you started looking at the weather for the flight within the preceding week. You could say, oh, I tuned in the weather channel on TV. Although it is not a specific aviation source, it will give you a outlook of what the weather is going to look like in a week, which can then help you have a better understanding of what the weather is going to look like getting closer to the date. And then you could say that in the morning you called flight service station for a standard weather briefing to complete the planning. And then you could call an hour before and call them again for an abbreviated weather briefing just to make sure that nothing has changed or that you checked for flight 50 million times before you decided to make the flight. That's what I do. So your examiner could ask you, tell me about the weather along our flight. Make sure that during the weather briefing, you are able to demonstrate that you understand the pressure areas that are affecting the weather, the fronts affecting weather and their direction of movement, as well as ceilings, winds, visibility at departure, as well as several points en route and the destination, wind direction and speed at cruise altitude, notums, and significant or adverse weather near the route or during possible flight time and how it can affect the flight, such as air mats, sig mats, convective sig mats. What are two weather charts that you use to prepare for a flight and how did you use them? Your examiner could ask, if your examiner asks you this question, you could reference surface analysis charts to see the pressure areas, such as the fronts, winds, local weather, and visual obstructions, and that is transmitted every three hours and covers the country, or you could talk to them about the weather depiction chart to get an overview of the surface conditions derived from METARs and other surface observations. It'll give you an overall picture of the weather across the United States and is transmitted every three hours. You could also use the significant weather prognostic chart to see the forecasts. Usually they will have a 12 and a 24 hour forecast and they're issued four times a day. The valid time is printed on each panel and the upper two panels show the forecast significant weather, which may include turbulence, freezing level, IFR and MBFR weather. Your examiner can ask you, tell me about two different weather forecasts that you use and preparing for a flight and how you use them. You could use the GFA tool to get a big picture of the general weather in the area, what is causing the weather and how it may change during the upcoming 24 hours. You could also demonstrate the use of a TAF to get a specific weather for certain weather reporting areas along the route of flight and how conditions at those airports can change. And this will allow you to evaluate the clouds and visibility that will allow my flight to continue into VFR. You can also find areas of VFR in case I run into unforecasted weather that I need to escape to. You can also use the winds and temperature aloft forecast with the wind direction and velocity to find the most desirable altitude, giving me the best ground speeds. Your examiner is going to most likely ask you a lot of questions about systems to make sure that you understand how the aircraft works. So he could ask you, how does the fuel system work on your aircraft? Well, in my Cessna 172, the airplane's fuel systems are located in the POH. Be sure that you can find the fuel system or the electri electrical system or the engine system and that you can explain exactly how it works. This is a big one, and a lot of people fail their check ride right at the beginning because they don't know how to do this. So let's talk about your passenger safety briefing. Assume that I'm your good friend who has never been in a small plane. Give me your passenger safety briefing. In my Google Doc, I have a FAA pass passenger briefing card that you need to make sure that you read off to your examiner on your check ride for all your check rides, because if you don't, you could fail instantaneously. Be sure that you are able to explain safety briefing and demonstrate your knowledge of the elements that come to a complete safety briefing and that you understand how to give an effective briefing at the start of flight. Be sure that you understand the acronym safety. My personal passenger safety briefing goes like this. I start with seatbelts. So please make sure that you fasten your seatbelt for taxi takeoff and landing and that your shoulder harness is fastened for takeoff and landing. In my Cessna 172, you have to have both on to have one on anyway. So just leave that on. Please be sure to adjust your seat. You lock it in with the little lever underneath the seat. This is how you work the air vents. You pull them out. Don't pull them out too much because then they'll fall out on the floor and it's a pain in the butt to put them back in. 
also fire extinguisher. There's no fire extinguisher in my airplane, but if there was one, I would show you where it is and how to use it. The way you would function exit doors and windows are like this, how to secure, operate, and evacuate the aircraft in case of an emergency landing. Emergency equipment such as uh, location and operation as in transponder in case something happens to me, the pilot, and you don't know what to do. Traffic uh, for scanning, spotting, and notifying me if we're flying today VFR and you notice a plane that I don't see, please let me know because it is critical to both of us flying the plane. Emergency equipment such as location and operation, I would show them where it is, as well as stroke cockpit expectations. Uh, during the taxi takeoff and landing phase of the flight, please make sure that you remain a sterile cockpit and that you allow me to talk to air traffic control and to spot traffic and be focused on the task at hand and that we're not talking about anything else that is irrelevant. And last but not least, your questions. There's no dumb questions, so it's more fun when people ask. So if you have any questions, please ask me and I will be sure to tell you. What are specific techniques that you would use for collision avoidance on your flight? Ensure that the windshield is as clean as possible so you have maximum visibility. Organize the cockpit to avoid a lot of head down time and flying pencils all over the place and losing things. Keep your head up and outside of the cockpit at all, at all times, especially during ground reference maneuvers. Perform clearing turns. Please do your clearing turns on your check ride, guys. Please do your clearing turns. Every single maneuver requires you to do clearing turns before they're done. Scan for traffic often while you're in straight and level flight and during maneuvers. Don't practice maneuvers over airports or areas where traffic normally converges, such as a takeoff area of an airport or any of that. Enter traffic patterns correctly at a 45 degree angle at non-terrored air airports, which is what I do, as well as abide by traffic pattern altitudes Listen on frequencies such as at uncontrolled airports to hear possible traffic. Visually verify that final approach is clear before taking the runway for takeoff as well as for landing. Use anti-collision lights and a landing light at night and during low times of visibility. So obviously, that's not going to apply on checkride because it won't be at night. As well as complying with the right-of-way rules. You can find this in 14 CFR 91.113. Last but not least, let's briefly go over your practical test checklist that you need to have for your check ride. So you need to have an appointment made, obviously, get your evaluator's name, the location of your check ride with your date and time, write it in your calendar. It's a very important date. Make sure that your aircraft is acceptable. So you have all of your aircraft documents ready in the plane, as well as printed out with copies and can show that your information for the aircraft is valid, such as your airworthiness certificate, your registrating, your registration certificate, operating limitations, as well as your aircraft maintenance records, your pilot operating handbook, or your FAA approved airplane flight manual, current weight and balance data, and be sure that for your personal equipment that you bring a view limiting device, your current aeronautical chart, printed or electronic, I would use an EFB, a computer and plotter, make sure so that you can recalc you can do recalculations, flight plan form and flight logs, as in your nav logs. I ha I would do it on four flight EFB, again, as well as your chart supplement, airport diagrams, and appropriate publications, and your current aim, which you can all do on your iPad. You also want to make sure that for your personal records, you have an identification as in photo signature ID. I would bring two forms just in case, but two forms of photo ID, your pilot certificate, a current medical certificate or basic med qualification, if applicable, a completed FAA form 8710-1 with your airman certificate or rating application with your instructor signature, which you'll do with your instructor before you take your check ride your original knowledge test report to prove that you're eligible and your pilot logbook with appropriate instructor endorsements as well as your approved school's graduation certificate if you're at a flight school and the fee that your examiner charges they're currently charging a thousand dollars here in dfw but that's going to be applicable for you 
All right, guys, we finally made it to the end. Again, if you made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching the video. This really did take me a few days to get through and actually sit down and talk to the camera for so long. Thank you guys for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe for more aviation content, and I will see you in the next one. I hope you enjoyed.